What's up? Welcome back to the Metalhead Car Show, and welcome to October, which those who follow me may notice that the setup's a little bit different. I thought to change it up a little bit going into October and going into Halloween, and perhaps we'll even do some Halloween-themed car or metal videos. But today, we're talking about the Holy Trinity. For those who don't know, the Holy Trinity of supercars is McLaren, Porsche, and Ferrari. And what seems like every decade, we have a brand new game changer supercar from McLaren, Porsche, and Ferrari. Now that all three manufacturers have confirmed they do have a new car coming out in the future, I kind of want to go step backwards in time and talk about some of the older cars and my thoughts on the newer cars. And if you agree or disagree with anything I have to say, let me know in the comments so let's get a conversation going about it. But for now, let's get right into it. Going back to the 1990s, where this all started, one of the earliest cars we saw with all these three was the McLaren F1. What's now one of the most legendary supercars ever built? And to go compete with that, Ferrari had the F50 out for the 50th anniversary of Ferrari, despite it came out a couple years too early and Porsche had the 911 GT1. The Ferrari F50 was built to be this race car for the road. It had the suspension bolted directly to the transmission. The engine share a lot with the Ferrari F1 engine at the time and had extremely 90s styling. A lot of people either really love this car or really hate this car, but nonetheless, I think it's super cool. The Porsche, on the other hand, is probably the craziest of the three, as when the F1 and the F50 were built to be at the end of the day, road cars. The Porsche 911 GT1 was built as a homologation vehicle to get the Porsche 911 GT1 in racing. So despite it is a 911 heart, it's longer, it's wider, it has an enormous spoiler, it makes like triple the horsepower of a standard 911 at the time. And when it was new, it cost something like a million dollars. But of the three, which one do I see as the winner? Well, I see the McLaren F1 as the winner. As when the Ferrari F50 was, well, it was hated for kind of a long time. People thought it was ugly and it just never had the legacy that the F40 had. And the 911 GT1, despite people know it's cool, it just does not get talked about anywhere nearly as much as the other two. As when the McLaren F1 has kind of built this legacy, it had the highest top speed of any road car for a very long time. I think it still has the highest top speed for any naturally aspirated car of all time. The steering wheel was in the middle, the engine bay was lined with gold, it had two luggage compartments. Those seem like really small things, but it's insane details like that that we've all remembered because this car was just such an icon of its time. So the 1990s, I'm giving it to the McLaren F1. Jumping forward to the early 2000s. The early 2000s had such a cool supercar boom. Like there was a lot of really cool cars came out of the early 2000s, but it had such an awesome supercar boom. And three of those cars being the Porsche Carrera GT, the Ferrari Enzo, and the Mercedes SLR McLaren. The Enzo came out to be the Ferrari F60, which people called it that for a while. But much like the F50 came out like five years before the 60th anniversary of Ferrari, so it stands as the Enzo. Nonetheless, it's super cool and the mule car actually used the body panels of Ferrari 348 as something to disguise it with. And as when Ferrari built the F40 to be a road car for the track, the F50 to be a race car for the road, this is built to be a road car. This is built to be something you can just go out and use as long as you have a million and a half bucks and Ferrari says you're allowed to buy one in the first place and you kiss the butts of everyone at Ferrari, you can go buy one. Well, as Ferrari was doing that, Porsche was working on the Carrera GT at the same time. Now, Porsche originally showed off the prototype for the Carrera GT in the early 2000s. At the time, it was using a naturally aspirated 5.5 liter V10, making about 550 horsepower. The V10 came from a failed F1 program Porsche was working on. It just never really took off, but they had the engine. So they still utilized the engine and formed the Carrera GT. By the time it came out in production, it had a 5.7 liter V10 making, I think, 612 horsepower and turned out to be this incredible analog supercar that revved so fast, like just nothing we've ever seen before. And much like the F50 I mentioned earlier, this was one of those cars that you could buy one for like two, three hundred thousand dollars and now they've just exploded in value and they are two million dollar cars easily. And most people generally believe that this is the best sounding car of all time. <laughs> 
What's your opinion on that? But there's also the SLR McLaren. Now, frankly, I think the SLR McLaren is kind of the black sheep of these three, as when Ferrari built the Enzo, Porsche built the Carrera GT, McLaren partnered with Mercedes to build this. And apparently the partnership they had to go build this thing was a nightmare to do. McLaren wanted a mid-engine hardcore supercar. Mercedes wanted a soft, really powerful GT Cruiser. Like, they couldn't agree on anything with this car. So for a car that was heavily compromised the entire time, I think it made a pretty crazy end product. But it very much feels like a Mercedes that McLaren took part in, but it's still Mercedes. So of these three cars, I'm gonna say the Carrera GT was the winner. As much respect as I do have for the Enzo and what Ferrari did with it to make this, I do think the Carrera GT walked away with the greatest legacy. As I said earlier, a lot of people generally believe it's the best sounding car of all time. A lot of people believe it's one of the best analog supercars of all time. Now I know this thing has a kind of weird history with how twitchy it can be, but it has made one of the best driver cars of all time. And of the three, I would argue that the Carrera GT is the one people talk about the most. But once again, we jump forward another 10 years. Now in the early 2010s, we started hearing rumors from Porsche about a hybrid mid-engine V8 supercar. Now we saw a lot of test photos, we saw a lot of mule cars, we saw cars with no bodywork going around the Nürburgring, but what we ended up getting was the 918 Spider. The 918 Spider was kind of the first step with Porsche using hybrid technology in their supercars. And what they made was a 880 horsepower hybrid V8 all-wheel drive hypercar that I think set the Nürburgring lap time record when it went around the first time and would hit 60 just as fast as a Bugatti Veyron. And whilst Porsche was working on that, McLaren was quietly working on the P1. Just like the Porsche, it was a hybrid V8 mid-engine hypercar, but unlike the Porsche, it was a twin-turbo hybrid V8 hypercar, so it was making 907 horsepower. 907 horsepower, rear-wheel drive, a little bit less tire. This thing was outrageously fast, but also it could be a little bit twitchy if you didn't know what you're doing. In number three, Ferrari announced the left Ferrari last. This is the first anniversary Ferrari that didn't actually bear the F70 or F name of any of them. And it was actually kind of cool, because Ferrari brought this thing out. It looked exactly like it did when it, when it actually came out. But they showed it off, started on winter testing, and it came out really fast. Like, of the three, I think this thing went from debut to sales faster than anyone else. And what we got was a naturally aspirated V12 with a hybrid system making 950 horsepower. I think people have said of the three, the Ferrari is the rowdiest pick. And personally, of the three, I think the Ferrari both sounds the best and looks the best. This is kind of a neat era because they're all starting to use hybrid systems. They're all trying to adapt using this brand new technology to get as much power out of these cars as possible. What's funny though, is despite that they're all hybrids, the Ferrari is the only car that doesn't have any sort of EV setting. So it's engine or hybrid system in full power. Fuel savings was not on the agenda. So of the three, which one do I pick? Honestly, I'm gonna go with the Ferrari. Frankly, I'm not a big Ferrari person, but at the same time, the left Ferrari was just the craziest looking of the three. I think it was the fastest of the three. And again, it sounded incredible. I think of the three, it's probably the most expensive right now. And honestly, I can see why. This felt like such a no compromise, we're here to win sort of car. I think when they first came out, I was on Team McLaren, but as time has went by, I'm on Team Ferrari for this one all day. Now for the new cars, we only know so much. I'm gonna get that out right now. The first one we got to see was the Porsche Mission X. Mission X is obviously the 918 Spider replacement. But unlike the 918 where it was a hybrid, this is gonna be full EV. Now, I did a video a while ago looking at the most powerful car from each manufacturer all ranked. It took like two hours to film. And it was actually in like the top five, I think, making something like 1500 horsepower. So of the three, I assume this is gonna be the most powerful car, but also of the three, it's the only one that's gonna be full electric. Ferrari has been in development for a little while of the Le Ferrari replacement. I'm calling it that because in the time of filming this video, I have not seen a name for this new car. Unlikely it's going to be called the F80, although it's the closest to the 80th anniversary of Ferrari than the 
and then they left Ferrari was to the 70th or the Enzo was to the 60th. But what I'm expecting from this is a bit more rowdy version of Ferrari's top V12, along with an upped version of their hybrid system they're currently using. Because if we look at the SF90, that car is using a hybrid system along with a twin turbo V8, it's making damn nearly a thousand horsepower. Less engine, it's making more power than the left Ferrari. Now to be completely honest, I don't know what the most powerful V12 Ferrari currently is, so editing David's be doing a lot of the work right now. This is the most powerful V12 Ferrari. It makes this much horsepower. So seeing that and knowing how much power the actual engine of the SF90 makes mixed with the electric motors, I believe the left Ferrari replacement is gonna be making this much power. Yes, very professional. But also we need to talk about the new McLaren, which is named the W1. It's named the W1 to kind of follow in the footsteps of both the P1 and the McLaren F1. And again, in the time of recording this video, I have yet to see any sort of performance numbers for this car or a spy shot for this car. So everything I'm about to say is purely speculation, nothing more. Since McLaren came back in like 2010, they've kind of used all things said and done two engines. But the 3.8 liter V8 that ended up turning into a four liter V8 that they've been using since the MP4-12C, I think. They've used different variants of that. They've had hybrid systems on it. They have changed turbo sizes. But as of this point right now, the most powerful version of it is in the McLaren Speedtail. The other engine they used was in the Solus GT, and it was a Judd V10. Now I severely doubt McLaren's been using a Judd engine in a road car. That's just not what they're built for. They're total race engines. And honestly, I don't really see them building a new engine for this. So I do think it's going to be a 4 or 4.2 liter V8 that they've kind of been using for the past decade and a half. That engine, bigger turbos, hybrid system, and I think this is probably going to be making 1,200 horsepower. Now, Speedtail is using a pretty heavily modified version of the 720S engine, which was a twin-turbo 4-liter V8. Sometimes past since then, they might be able to crank out a little bit from the engine. Now, Tavares building his P1, he has claimed that 1,300 horsepower is possible from that engine, and he has went and upgraded all the components in his 675 long tail to be just beefier, more heavy duty components to handle more power. So all this should be doable. Whether McLaren will do it or not is up in the air. I don't think it's be making as much power as the Porsche, but also I do think it's be making north of 1100 horsepower. Bigger question is, will McLaren make it a center seat car? God, I hope so. So there you have it. That is my thoughts on the upcoming Holy Trinity cars, but I want to know what do you think? Which one of the upcoming Holy Trinity cars are you most excited to see on the road and be tested? And if you want, let me know your favorite car from each decade of the Holy Trinity cars in the comments. Thank you all so much for watching. Like, subscribe if you enjoyed what you've seen. I tend to post three-ish times a week, and I'll see you later.